First of all, I was going to talk just about the general overview of things that people in my group have done and other related groups, Binutils, LVL, VM, Go, glibc, and GNU compiler support. And, but I'll mostly talk about the GNU compiler support, which is what I work on. Binutils, um, ISA 3.0 instructions, that's essentially what's in Power 9. We're added in Binutils 2.26. And w one of the things is, is we are working with the various Linux distributions that run on PowerPC servers so that by the time the actual hardware shows up, Binutils 2, something that supports ISA 3, 3.0, whether it be Binutils 2.26 or backport patches or whatever, is in their Binutils so that users can at least get access to the assembly version of the, of the new instructions. LLVM, a um, couple years ago we were, all, we were mostly supporting just the XL compiler and GCC sort of as an afterthought. It's now, we have four compilers we're supporting because Go is sort of its own little universe, LLVM, GCC, the traditional XL compiler. And they did a lot of work uh, on um, supporting the ISA 207, that's Power 8, for a handful, except for a handful of privileged instructions remaining. Um, at least in the assembler, I, I don't know how much in terms of the compiler. And they're now adding the Power 9 support. They added int 128 and the vector int 128 types. And Clang support for the IEEE 128 floating point type and a sanitizer, new vector APIs to the altvec.h, and support for the thread sanitizer. And now, they're in, in addition to just enablement work, they're doing optimization. So they're, they're adding shrink wrapping, or much like within GCC, where shrink wrapping is becoming important. It's becoming important in the LLVM space. Direct moves when converting connect scalers to vectors. Direct move is the instruction that moves from the GPR register set to the vector register set, or vector floating point register set, in that was added in Power 8. And in additional improvements in vectorization code, remove unnecessary vector swaps, coalescing basic blocks guarded by the same branch condition, expanding ICEL into if then else. ICEL is the instruction that was originally added in the embedded Power PCs that basically is a conditional move instruction. Um, up until Power 8 time frame, including in Power 8, we found it hard to actually use the instruction where it actually performs well. We're promised that it's going to be much better in Power 9, but we'll see when we actually get the silicon. And then they too are adding ISA, ISA exploitation. And they've also now been working on build bots so that they build all the things on Big Endian, Little Endian, Big Endian, Power 7, Little Endian, Power 8, um, you know, and when, when general silicon becomes available and it, it's in a c consumer ready form, that I imagine they'll be doing p build bots for that and adding runtime configuration and turnaround and, and so forth. And as I said, Go is now becoming its own language fed mostly by Docker, but also presumably by, by Google. Uh, the 1.7 uh, that uses the GCC Go, they added um, essentially built-in functions for supporting the atomics. The crypto instructions that were added in uh, the Power 8 or ISA 2.07, memmove support, and byte SQL and square root. For Go 1.8, they are moving the infrastructure to use SSA. And they have finally added the VMX support. In the history of the PowerPC, VMX was the original G5 uh, that was Apple, and then the Power 6 had it also. It was the original vector instruction set. And um, so then we had VSX, which is the Power 7 instruction set, and Power 8 had some modifications, and Power 9 will, will have more. So they're coming into, into supporting more of the thing because th they started from a, from a much further, you know, we've been working on GCC much longer than they had been working on LLVM. Sure. And uh, um, Carlos is going to talk about the GLAC stuff in the next thing, so I'll skip over. 
Okay, one of the things I, I mentioned, I try generally to use ISA, sometimes I go into machine. ISA is, is the definition of the instructions. ISA 3.0 will be the in instructions for the forthcoming Power 9. Um, and Power is the name of the machines that IBM sells to customers. And then I'll be talking a lot about Power 9 and both what's in Power 9 and, and things that I've done, I and the others in the group have done to support Power 9. And if I have time, I'll talk about other things that we've done besides Power 9 and for existing customers. Yes, Smith. Why do you have two names? Why not six? Because, uh, because of open power, people might be in the future. Well, in fact, that's the next slide. Um, open power is a consortium of people. Right now, IBM is the only one selling Power PC, Power 8 chips, and some Power 9 chips. But there are other companies that are going to want to sell their own processors. So the idea is, is Power 9 is what you get from IBM, but ISA 3.0 is the general specification. Right now, it's a one-to-one -one correlation, but <laughs> I would expect in the future there might be some Power 9 plus this other functional unit or something else, but they don't tell me. <laughs> it, you know, I haven't signed enough NDAs to, to be able to know what, what will be going on and all that kind of stuff. I, I would hope, uh, well, we're trying to put our foot down and say you support the whole specification. You can support additional things. So you'll have additional M options or something like that. But we really don't want to get into the situation we had with the earlier Freescale chips where they decided, oh, they liked everything but the um, uh, reciprocal approximation instructions. And even though those were clear, the ISA 2.04 said you must support these. They said, oh, so what? <laughs> but we are doing, trying to simplify the number of switches. You know, we'll still have the switches for debugging, but not tell everybody about all the switches. But if in the future there's a Chinese version of Power 9 that doesn't have these particular instructions, then we will document those switches. And so ISA 2.06 was Power 7, 207 was Power 8. We decided, originally it was going to be 208 for Power 9, but we decided there were enough changes and it was just easier to go to the new number. And internally though, everything is target underscore P9 underscore whatever, so. <laughs> we're at least trying to be consistent in the external space, not in terms of the developing space. Okay, Power, the ISA was released in December 2015. Now, the, the timing is we had to manage upper management to make sure that we got the ISA specifications out before GCC 6.0. And so it was a tight race, and many people, David and uh, Stephen Rombach and uh, what are my boss, Raymond Harney, are, uh, you know, were able to get, the, get those deadlines so that we could release it in a timely fashion and then have, have it in GCC, some support in GCC 6. But more of the details were announced last week at Hot Chips. And we couldn't talk too much about it other than the name. The name has already been out. You know, and given it Power 8, you know what the next name is going to be. But most of the, the idea is, is that most of the support is going to be in GCC 6.2, uh, at least a good base level support. And then we're now working with the various Linux distributions that do the power server machines to make sure that 6.2 will be available, maybe as the default compiler, maybe as a vec vendor compiler or something like that, but at least 6.2 will be available by the time the hardware shows up to the clients. And now we've pretty much frozen and we're not putting new enhancements into 6.2. You know, we'll do bug fixes and other things like that, but all the support is going into GCC 7. Okay, what's in ISA 3.0? One of the big things is, again, these are just the chapter headings and I'll get into them. A little NDN, what we call deform addressing, direct move, integer support, vector insert extract, vector constants, array index, 
64-bit integer multiply and add <laughs> modulus, uh, floating point, fusion, and so forth. A little Indian support is probably one of the biggest things and is actually a sign that the hardware people are listening to us. We we are now. I I was on the, one of the, the committee on the com the committees to to work with the hardware folk on what will be in Power Nine, and in the late stages of the Power Eight announcement, it was decided that everybody wanted little Endian, not big Endian. So we made this massive change to 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 support little Endian, and. The, um, but unfortunately, the power vector system in particular, most of the power PC outside of the vector system was Endian neutral. As long as you did load word, load byte, you know, you loaded a whole thing at a time, it would do the byte swapping and all that kind of stuff. But the vectors were not. The vectors were fundamentally big Endian. And of course, I, I do remember back when I joined IBM seven years ago, uh, first starting the ISA 206, uh, Power 7, and asking, will I ever have to support little Indian VSX? Oh, no, you'll never have to support that. <laughs> but anyway, but the, the one of the things we added was little Indian, right now, when you load a vector, you have to do a load vector and then swap double words so that you get the, each, the vector basically, it will swap the bytes in each of the units. So when it's loading, a vector of double words, it will swap the bytes in each of the double words, but not swap the double words. And so you then have to do a, a vector XX perm DI, a permute, to, to do that. And so we added a new instruction to replace that, that just does, does the right thing, loads up 128 bytes, 128 bits, and swaps them and stores them, and you don't have to do all the stuff. We had a, a, a pass for optimization to try and eliminate for example, if you're doing load, store, and you weren't doing any operation, or if you're doing operations that were all in parallel, like add or something, and you didn't really need the, the fields, it would eliminate the extra permutes. And so we, of course, no longer need that pass. So we put it in for one machine and took it out for the next. And it's unfortunate that the name of the instruction, LXV, is similar to the old Altavec instruction, L. VX, and I mentally swapped them. The problem is, is the original Altavec instruction was nice. It did the right thing in terms of byte swapping, but the but in the original Altavec instruction set, it ignored the bottom three bits of the address thing. It said, "Oh, you're always going to be aligned and all that kind of stuff." So we can't use that except on stack frames. But you know, I mentally every so often <laughs> do the wrong instruction. Next up is what we call deform support. I um, mean, the PowerPC addressing, there are two main modes of addressing. It's register plus register, which is called XForm. And if, if the base register is R0, it's, it's zero, so it's just an indirect. And then register plus offset. The GPR and the floating point scalers had <coughs> deform addressing but the Altavec registers, which are now the upper part of the vector registers, did not have deform addressing, and we didn't have deform addressing for vectors. So we now have added um, what we call deform support. And um, I've already talked about all that. When we a added the original support for VSX, they had support for double precision in al the Altavec registers, but it took a few revs to, to get that support in to allow this stuff, and a lot of, a lot of bashing your head to get for reload and all that kind of stuff, getting, getting the right constraints because the Altavec were only X form register plus register, and the, um, so you had to, to do push, uh, you know, generate the constants and all that kind of stuff. And then, we also, in Power 8, then added the support for, for single precision floating point in, in Altavec registers as well. So that was also added. But now, under ISA 3.0, we, we do have deform support as long as the bottom two bits are, are zero because of encoding issues. So 
you, you can't have an offset of three or something like that, you know, but 32 bits and 64 bits will almost typically have zero on the bottom two bits. And this eliminates a lot of the low to median instructions that we had to do to generate those constants. We also did in vector support. Now, again, because of encoding concerns, we're for some of the opcodes, we're running out of space. We, we now have four bits that have to be zero, uh, much similar to the load quad instruction that we enabled in Power 8. And so, in general, this means you can't use like an address or, or label because you don't know that the, the thing, but it is useful for stack offsets, you know, stack pointer plus 32 or stack point or structure member plus 64 or something like that. And it, it makes it much easier for spilling and restoring. However, it took a long time to get it to work with the register allocator because you have to do a lot of futzing about in secondary uh, reload. And I, I got to the point where I couldn't find where I, I wasn't putting the right push whatever. It was working for LRA, but at the time we hadn't switched to LRA. And so um, Peter Bergner eventually fixed it found all the places that he we needed to do the fix up for so that it would still work with reload. And that got in just before 6.2 froze. Well, dform is, is register plus offset. And xform is register plus register. It's in the ma it's in the manual of the of the power PC. And so we just tend to call them that but As I mentioned before, direct move is the instruction that was added in power eight to move between the two register sets, between the GPR and the floating point ve vector register set. They added a direct move in power eight. It only moves a 64-bit value. But of course, the vector registers are up to 128 bits. So we fixed some of the holes in power nine, ISA 3.0. Uh, we added a direct move variant that takes two GPRs and merges them into one vector so you don't have to move the two 64-bit values independently and then do a permute. And then a direct move variant that also moves the bottom part. So, so if you were doing like a register extract of the bottom 64-bit element, you won't have to do a, a, a permute and then a, then a move. You can do the move directly. And finally, then we added, in the original VSX, uh, we added um, splat 64-bit instructions. Uh, but we now add splat 32-bit instructions. There was a splat uh, once it's in the register, but there's a direct move splat and a load with splat also. Are, are there many opportunities to use that? Actually, there are. I was surprised. I, I have a slide at the very end that shows how many of the spec benchmarks use it at least once. Now, of course, it may only use it once. I was only counting that it was used at all. But, um, and these can help in moving 128-bit uh, stuff. One of the things, you know, in GCC 5, uh, we added double precision in, in Altifact registers. In GCC 6, we added single precision. In now in GCC 7, we had the 64-bit integers to be in um, Altavec registers. It was originally meant, I meant to do it earlier, but I, I got to, I um, just ran out of time. But it, it's one of those things you have to kind of go through the whole pass and make sure that every place where you do DI, you, you use the appropriate constraint and, and so forth. And while it, it actually will work on Power 7 and Power 8, most of the remaining stuff that I have to do, or a lot of the remaining stuff I have to do, depends on integers being in um, vector in Altavec registers. Some of them are Altavec only encodings. That be the encoding. If you have extra bits, you can say whether it's in the traditional floating point or the Altavec registers. But some of the encodings are only Altavec registers, so I have to have integers in in the in those register sets. 
And this came at the end of GCC 6.2. And after the third patch that I had to fix the code, I, I said, I'm not going to try even try to strain Seger and David's patience and put this in GCC 6.2. So this, this and anything that depends on this are not in GCC 6.2. Now, one of the things that has been traditional in the PowerPC forever is that integers are not allowed in the floating point unit, and by extension now the vector unit. Uh, up until the power seven days, you did not have a load instruction for 32-bit integers or stores. Well, you had a load in power six, and s but not the store. You, you need both the load and the store to ma make it useful. Power 9 ISA 3.0 adds support for doing a, a load of an 8-byte thing or a 16-byte thing as a zero extended. And then there's a sign extension instruction. So you can, in theory, add um, small integers in the vector registers. However, after 20 years of fighting register allocation, I don't yet have the courage to, to enable this because I have this feeling that the, we will get a lot of direct moves that say, oh, I want to save this register in the, in the unit and, and then save, move it back. And it, particularly in Power 8, the direct move instruction is faster than a store and a load, but not by much. <laughs> but the register allocator tends to think, oh, it's a, it's a one cycle instruction. You know, we, we're trying to tune that and all that kind of stuff, but it's still one of these things that it can be, you know, a global, global change that I'm not sure we're ready to do yet, but it, it would also generate more instructions since the, the 8 and 16 byte load instructions don't have the deform, the, the register plus offset addressing. They only have the register plus register addressing. And as I said, they also don't sign extend. So you, if you're doing a load, you, you might have to do a load and a sign extend, and, and you could use the vector unit for doing the add, but I have, but it, it, may, it, it may come up someday, but I'm not sure there's a time in GCC 7 to do that. Um, new in, the new instructions now allow us to convert this, this stuff, but what we do instead is, is the places where we want 8 and 16-bit values in the register unit, we now have special combiner patterns. For example, convert floating point to a, a character thing, a character value, 8-bit value. Originally did a convert floating point to 64-bit integer, store 64-bit integer on the stack, load it in power 7, or convert to 64-bit integer, do a direct move if you're in 64-bit mode to a GPR, and then and then do the, the store. And now we, c we can do the store directly via combiner. It's, it's a hack, but sometimes you, it's useful to do the hack rather than trying to do the right solution. <laughs> In addition to a lot of the other stuff, they added generalized insert and extract instructions where basically you can ex insert and or extract um, byte, 16-bit, 32-bit, or 64-bit from a vector register or to a vector register at any byte offset. So that w I'm just starting to, to put in the support for this right now. Um, the, the offset, it has to be constant. So you have to, you know, you know if you're getting one particular byte, you can, you can get this easily. And there are also now, in the, in the traditional PowerPC, there's these rotate left and, and and with mask instructions and rotate, you know, double word and, and so forth. They have parallel versions that do it on vectors in the vector unit. We haven't yet exploited them. At some point I probably will, but it, it has, I haven't done that yet. Now, this, that might, one of the motivations, though, for allowing small integers in the vector registers would be for when you have 128-bit structures and you want to get bits and pieces out and all that kind of stuff. So it's one of these things I, I go back and forth on in terms of 
the, the utility of doing this. And as I said, we're just starting to support these types. Um, recently, I've gone through the vector extract and optimized them for power 8 and power, power 9, ISIS 2.07 and ISIS 3.0. And um, when I get back, I'll, I'll work on the, ex the insert operation. Uh, so I did extract and initialize to build vectors and, and all that kind of stuff. I had all these optimization, I had some optimizations in to if you were building a vector and then storing it to just do the stores directly, but it actually slows down one of the spec benchmarks. And I haven't taken the time to figure it out. So right now, I'd, I haven't put that. I, I, I still combine it and do the store. And as I said, the vector rotate left and mask instructions are not yet used. One of the minor little things, but actually it's fairly useful, is there's a new instruction called XSplit IB, which inserts the same byte literal byte in, in all um, bytes of, of a vector register, which can be useful for making constants. So for example, if you need a constant from minus 250, minus 128 to positive 127, you can load it up and then do a vector sign extend to get it into the scalar part of the vector register. And um, one of the things I've done is Right now, we have been using X, uh, XOR to clear a register and ORC to um, set a register all to ones. And it's a theoretical problem that if, if you did an operation that's really slow, like a divide, and then a store, the store will be bound to that, that thing in, in the runtime unit, but the register will not be available until the divide is done. And so if the next thing you do is an XOR even though you're not using any of the bits of that value, it, it could override it. So I now, for setting zero and minus one, use the XSplit B in, in the ISET 3.0. And of course, there's always more work that needs to be done. It would be nice at some point to go through the vector, you know, loading constants into register, into vector registers, um, do it in a more general fashion. For example, one of the thoughts I've had is, is it would be faster to do a low, load integer and then a convert from integer to floating point than a store, than a load in some cases. And I want to test that and all that kind of stuff. But we can do more general patterns by shifts and all that kind of stuff. Of course, you, you can generate 20 instructions and you're not slow, not faster, so, but so it, it's a trade-off. But One of the minor things that the languages folks did that actually turns out to be used by every single benchmark is an instruction that combines 32-bit so sign extension and shift, a shift immediate, uh, that is very useful for array indexing because people use int as their int i equals one to whatever loops. And so instead of sign extend and then shift, we now replace it with this instruction. Um, And I also added it to combine it with a load. And uh, if, if you're doing a load uh, from memory and then sign extending it, you would do normally do a load sign extend operation and then, and then the shift. And I added a combiner pattern that does the load zero extended and then, and then the, the shift. And the reason is, is that internally, the load sign extended instructions are, are cracked as two instructions. One is load zero extend and then an explicit sign extend. So I'm eliminating that second cracked instruction. And there's also a record form in the PowerPC. A lot of the instructions have a period that for scalar values will set uh, CR0 to be compared against zero, which can be useful. And I put it in just sort of a, a, a whim. It was easy to do. And it turns out that there are several places that it actually does do a Convert, uh, sign extend, shift, and then compare it to zero. <laughs> and 
they added 64-bit integer multiply and add. I believe the main thing was is there's a lot of people worrying about cryptography and in crypto, you tend to want to do large arithmetic and multi-precision arithmetic. So they added the 64-bit integer multiply and add to help these, these operations. And I added the support, you know, it's a fairly easy combiner task to, to do this, uh, just of the uh, multiply and add low, the low bits. It would be nice to sometime go back and add the support for 128-bit arithmetic. But we also had a modulus instruction. Um, historically, the PowerPC has only had a divide instruction, and so you always had to do divide, multiply, subtract if you wanted a modulus <coughs> operation. And um, so they now have 32-bit um, and 64-bit signed and unsigned modulus. And however, it is faster to do, if you're doing printf where you're doing both a divide and a modulus at the same time, you know, the, the div mod patterns and so forth, it is faster to um, do, do the divide and then and then the subtract, multiply and subtract. I have a peephole right now, peephole tune right now to catch that, but it would be better to switch to use div mod for all this. But you know, there's always ten thousand things on my to-do list. Now, one of the things is this was added uh, sort of at the last minute. We one of the major spec benchmarks has min-max in the middle of it, floating point, essentially floating point min-max. PowerPC had, in, in VSX, added min-max instructions that are based on the ISO standard for f-max and f-min. Unfortunately, if you're not running in fast math, the, um, you get the wrong result for NANDs. Because, um, you know, and so if you're open coding min max as a lot of people do of if a less than b question mark a colon b um, and one and a is an and it will not get the nan in, in the result or or vice versa. So we added instructions that do the right thing, and because it won't be in the first internal silicon that won't ship to anybody but favored customers. You know, I am hoping but before the end we will actually enable the min-max stuff, but right now we have to be careful not to enable it unless you say that you ha you're going to have the new hardware. In addition to that, and we haven't taken too much advantage of it yet, but I can imagine places where we want to do it. In the vector unit, you have these compare instructions that generate vectors of either 0 or minus 1, so you can do masking operations, select operations, and things like that. And they added these operations for the scalar part as well. Now, you could have done it if you put something into the bottom part. You know, otherwise, if you had a signaling, that just happened to be a signaling NAN in the bottom part of your 64-bit word, which is not set by the, when you're doing any 64-bit operation. Or it's not promised in the manual what it's set to be. I, you know, obviously, it's always going to be set to something. But we haven't taken too much advantage of these yet. I'd have to look at the, the thing. Uh, but basically, e um, we, we wanted a particular thing, and they wanted a particular thing. And it was easier just to, <laughs> to add both of them. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, there's some specific difference. And it's in the ma it should be in the manual. <laughs> Or whatever, or I can. A if you ask me, I email me. I'll, I'll, I'll do. It. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, I think it's Java does not have minus zero, so they wanted something that always gave you a positive zero. I triple arithmetic is just so fun. <laughs> Hopefully Khan is not in the room. <laughs> but talking about IEEE arithmetic, as many of you know, 
We've been trying to add float 128 to the thing for two years, and this is the motivation for adding it, is finally we now have hardware that does float 128. I actually hope that we have more than one or two academic users that will actually want to use it. But right now, the, we add the, add the support for the instructions. But we still have a long, so, uh, oh, and also, in terms of the instructions, there's both the normal add, subtract, multiply, divide, but there's add, subtract, multiply, divide, round to odd, and also conversions. And the reason for the round to odd is, is if you're wanting to use floating point formats that are bigger than 64-bit and less than 128-bit, and you can probably guess what value they were thinking of, round to odd gives you a better, better rounding than, than the normal round. GCC does not have any plans to use those other than in the one case of converting IEEE 128 to single precision because there's no direct instruction. In internally, w in the vector unit, single precision is always represented as double precision. And, and then you do a round, and, and so it's easier to... I you get the, the, w the last bit correct if you do the round to odd rather than the round, and then, uh, and then truncate to 32-bit. Currently, we're using the float 128 keyword that Intel uses, and we're hoping to switch over in GCC7 to Joseph Meyer's new float N support that just went in. But we need to retain float 128 compatibility because people will be developing on GCC 6.2 and, and, and so forth. Oh, okay. So we probably then keep need to keep it also in float 128. It's I, I need to get back into float 128 mode. I've been doing all the other stuff. And uh, I, I skipped over the glibc slides, but one of the big things we're doing this year is the outside of the compiler thing, is now that we have the basic support in the compiler that runs in Power 7 and Power 8 in emulation mode and Power 9 in hardware mode, we need to add all the support in the library. We still aren't at the point where we want to switch long double from IBM extended double, which is two pairs of doubles, to um, IEEE 128. You know, I presume in 2017 we will have an option to do that, but we, we need to get the library, and, and then after glibc, we, I, we need to look at um, libquadmath, make sure that it builds, and libstandardc++, so that in theory, by the GCC 7 chip, you on a Linux pa PowerPC system, you'll be able to to use, we'll be able to enable that, and we'll be able to enable one float 128 uh, by default. Because right now, if you use Boost and you um, have float 128 enabled by default, it will try and use libquadmath and not find it because we can't build libquadmath right now. So. But, you know, there is a theoretical problem in that the floating point emulation is only enabled under Linux. You know, I don't know if there are 64-bit NetBSDs running out there that don't have the VSX unit enabled or whatever, but... Now, in addition to a lot of the other things, the math library people got their digs in into things that they would really like in, in the uh, Power 9 architecture. And so they added a bunch of instructions that allow you to crack floating point values to either compare two exponents to see if the exponents are the same or, and, um, or greater than or less than. And scalar and vector version of insert exponent, extract exponent, and extract the significant, and also do a test that you can do, map into FP classify. We haven't done any work with that other than adding built-ins, but the math library people in GLC are presumably starting to look at using these where, th where they can. Then we get into fusion. 
If you remember, probably f a year or two ago, I talked about Power 8 Fusion. And the idea is, is that you want to generate the standard PowerPC instructions, but if you have these two instructions that are next to each other, the hardware will figure it out and, and join them together, and you won't have the um, delays because one, you, know, you have to wait for one instruction to finish before the next one can use it. And so it, it had low GPR fused with ADIS in the register, the ADIS being the setting the high bit. So it's a load with an offset instruction. And because R0 cannot be in it a base register, it, it's only registers 1 through 31. And this is done by a peephole. And then also the load vector f was fused with the add immediate, which we needed because we didn't have the, the deform addressing. The hardware people, don't at the particularly in Power 8, didn't want to have a fusion instruction that produced two results. With the load instruction, because it was a destructive operation, you used the ADIS in the same register that you were loading. There was essentially, as far as the hardware is concerned, only one result. Now, I, I put a lot of effort in, and I, I think I found one benchmark that's 1% faster and one that's 1% slower or something. So, <laughs> but Power 9 has more general fusion, and that is, is the deform load and store are fused with ADIS, and they don't have to be uh, destruct destructive. It can be any, any register. X form can be fused with add immediate. There's fusion of various integer constants, X or, or, or and AND combinations. Uh, fusion of a vector move and permute. And fusion of add PCS and deform loads. Add PCS is a, is a new instruction also that adds the PC to an intermediate value that allows you to simulate um, PC relative loads. And the trouble is, it's six cycles, or it's, it's slow enough that I, di I didn't spend time actually trying to implement it. So the history is, is I started work on the Fusion before starting to work on, on the Power 9, and before enabling scalar support in the Ultifect registers. And then I put it aside, it was working, and um, then I added support for the scalar registers. And of course, the peoples only look for the floating point registers for one of the fusions. So we have to expand that a little bit and work on it. And um, the only constant form is the ADIS followed by om or immediate. I also discovered if I put the fusion stuff in, in the instant for the permute, it generated so many permutes that it actually generated the wrong code. So. <laughs> Miscellaneous. Um, they also added a vector negate D, that's an uh, integer and double precision, 64-bit uh, and 32-bit. The original Ultifec instruction set did not have a negate instruction. Instead, you had to form a zero and then do a subtract. So at least they, g they gave us those two, and they, they show up a little bit. And again, because they ran out of time or encoding or whatever, they added a, they did not have an XPerm instruction, a permute instruction that did all the uh, vector registers. Instead, you could only use the Ultivec registers. So if you wanted to do a generalized permute instruction, you had to move them into the vector registers through the permute. And all three, the two source, re source registers being permuted and the mask register and the target all had to be Ultivec registers. So you generated a lot of moves. They added a form. It, it is, the um, target must overlap one of the, the arguments, the second argument. And because of Little Endian, we also now have a reverse form of permute, permute R and D perm R, that permutes in the opposite direction. So instead of byte zero being the top byte, byte zero is now the bottom byte. And they added um, both scalar and vector forms of count trailing zeros. So you were asking how, how well these things were done. Uh, just before coming here, I, I built uh, Power9 spec and uh, just to see how much all the different things were used. Deform vector 
that's the um, register plus offset. All 29 of the spec 20, 2006 benchmarks used it. This, this is 03 with all the various options that I typically do. I, I don't do OFAST because there, there's some issue with, the, with one of the Fortran benchmarks that the vector splat byte also, I believe that's mostly the zero and one. Uh, integer modulus two is everybody uses. Array index, most of them use. Min max 24 of the benchmarks used, and I also discovered three of them now generate ins and not found. Uh, so I, I have my work cut out for me. I haven't tested that in a while. And it only shows up in complex programs. It doesn't show up in the little test program. Deform Altavec Scaler, 22 of the 29. Because you only tend to see the deform, the scalers and Altavec registers used when you need more than 32 registers. It favors using the traditional floating point registers over the Altavec registers. But, you know, some things do want 60, reg 60 floating point registers. And direct move in the load splat, 21. Sign extend, vector scaler. 21, a lot of that's from the extract code. Uh, the 64-bit multiply and add, 19, I suspect most of that is a, essentially array indexing where you have multiple array uh, values. Um, and then the GPR to one vector, the, uh, the move direct, 17, the 8-bit load and store, 8 of the 29. So the, your question before about how many places use uh, care short in converting to and from floating point. Eight of the of the spec 2000 benchmarks <laughs> support it. And the direct move, seven of the 29. I was actually surprised that we were generating that much, but mm. in you know in traditional classic code. And vector extract, two of the 29 benchmarks use it. In addition to all the stuff that the native code generation, we're, we have one person, Kelvin, who is spending most of the time adding all the built-ins for all the things that the compiler may not generate right now, either because there are specialized instructions or things that we just haven't gotten around to. Um, but various other things that the Power9 adds Hardware random number, just about everybody these days has some way of getting a hardware random number. As I said, count trailing zero, parity. Bit permute, um, this is a special instruction used by one of the IBM things for their hashing code. And they had the scalar form and now they have the vector form of it. Uh, vector absolute difference, that's the take two bytes and, and subtract them and return the absolute value of, of the difference. Um, and it's used in the X, it's used in X.64 code, but it's not used in the spec benchmark X.64 because it, it does it the, the other way and, you know, just by open coding. Um, vector left shift and right shift variable. I don't remember all the details of what that instruction does. Uh, built math built-ins that I mentioned previously. There are also new decimal instruction. I haven't really wanted to touch decimal, so, uh, you know, they're, they're adding the stuff. And we found out just recently that a few of the instruction, now, we tend to view our customers as primarily now 64-bit. And some of the distros, in fact, are helping us by even on the big Indian systems and saying they also would prefer not to see 32-bit anymore. Um, but we, you know, we still do support 32-bit, and we discovered that several of the instructions put their value in the upper bytes rather than the lower bytes of the scalar position. And we asked the hardware guys, and they said, well, it's because for the lower bytes, they need more wires because of the carries and all that kind of stuff. And it was just they were running out of wires or something. And <laughs> so there are some instructions you can't get that you might want to use in 32-bit that you can't get a hold of. And Um, these are other instructions that are being added that we haven't yet gotten to. There's more byte swap support. Um, traditional PowerPC had a byte swap for um, load, load with byte swap and store with byte swap, but there wasn't a byte swap within the register. 
And so when we do the B swab operation, we have to generate six instructions to do the swab. So there's now a, an instruction to do that and within the vector too, so you don't have to do a permute. There's 16-bit floating point. There's no hardware to do 16-bit floating point, but there is a conversion from the 16-bit floating point form to 32-bit floating point, and both in vector and in um, scalar form. And the reason is, is that uh, as we add things like the NVIDIA and so forth, a lot of the GPUs have 16-bit floating point. Some people feel that Machine learning also likes to use 16-bit floating point, so there might be things in the future that might use that more. So far, we haven't added a new Floyd 16 type or anything like that. And the plan of record for GCC7 is just to use a 32-bit 30, integer type or something like that, 16-bit integer type, and not, not yet add the baggage of a whole new type and keyword. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it it so you may see in a few years I or somebody else will talk about that. But we um, there's also in addition to the math library functions, we added some instructions for string libraries, load sort with length, either both left justified and right justified and compare not equal type instructions uh, that are you, you will be useful to optimize for the, the library. And we're going to add the built-in soon, and presumably glibc will, will use them. As I said, there's this add immediate PC shifted. Right now, the GCC compiler is not planning to use it, other than possibly as a built-in. But the Java inter interpreter was thinking about doing it in their JIT client. You know, at some point, it may be useful to do it with add PCS. You only do it once in the function, and then you get a base pointer and, and, and do that. I, I haven't had time to, to think about that. Um, presumably, we'll need to add built-ins for the three people in the world that want to do IEEE floating point with odd rounding. Or they can just use the Excel compiler, which already supports it. Um, and then we'll need to do the various in insert and extract functions. I have them in the when you say vec extract and all that kind of stuff, but we don't actually have a built-in form for them. And, and as I said, there's a string compare not equal that you can will be helpful for doing like memcomp and and things like that. Java specifically added asks for something called load word monitored that. Um, allows them to do this load word and either ignore the bottom bits or something. It, do, it does something special for them. And, <laughs> and since I, ha I, I didn't see a use for it, I didn't keep what it was in my long-term memory. And the, you know, things never are final. There are some instructions right now that there may be a 3.0b variant that they're talking about. But until it, it's public, I can't actually say what those are. But, but that means the appellant will have to do No, actually, they will be in the second DDR2. We just got the final word of what instructions will be in the, the DDR2. But they haven't been published yet. In fact, I'm going to be missing the meeting and talking about some of them uh, flying back on Monday. In addition to Power9, we, we have lots of other work, including existing customers and all this other kind of stuff. Of course, since I'm the one pre preparing the slides, I tend to focus only on the, the, the stuff I, I've been working on. But finally, we moved to LRA. Um, we're the last of the big ports to switch to LRA, I believe, unless th there's others that uh, yeah, and um, for us, the big we had fixed mo all the code gen issues we had found in the GCC six time frame, but when I did a spec benchmark run, one benchmark four or three GCC, which is an older version of GCC for the x eighty six, slowed down by about four percent, and it turned out that LRA wasn't supporting some of the um, reload legitimized address 
that uh, Reload was supporting. And the additional ad immediates to reform those addresses was causing slowdown in GCC. Now, we tend to view that 403 GCC is the most important spec benchmark, not because we love GCC, but because it is more representative, we found, of user code than MCF, which is nothing but scalar, uh, going through memory as fast as you can, or libquantum, or something like that. You know, those are important to those users, but the majority of business type users are small functions, branchy, um, jump all over the place, you know, <coughs> don't have well-constrained data, don't have hotspots. GCC has one of the flattest profiles in the, in the spec benchmark. And um, once we did switch, we did have one particularly good success, Gromax is now 9% faster with LRA. But of course, LRA, those changes aren't going back in GC6 six as, as far as I know. So we still have to support reload as we do the backports. And as I mentioned before, I was doing extract and insert stuff. And in addition to the Power 9 support, I've been adding Power 8, particularly Power 8 64-bit, because in Power 8 64-bit, you have the direct move, and you can move things from the GPR unit easily to the uh, pointing point unit, whereas in 32-bit, um, you could still do the move to floating point unit, but you have to do four instructions, so it isn't as profitable. And um, other elements other than 64-bit would use a stack temporary. They would store the value on a stack and then do loads back and forth. Because of the way the PowerPC hardware is, this really slowed things down. Um, where you had four, if you're doing 32-bit integers, you had four stores and then one vector load. And the store forwarding unit um, wasn't really ready for different size loads and stores. So it ha would have to flush the pipeline to wait for this thing to, to rematerialize. And then, then I started doing this. Um, at the moment, extract and initialization are done. And I hope to start on vector set when I get back. And for the vector set, I want to use the new instructions I mentioned, but provide a fallback for ISA 207. I, in addition to direct constants, I also finally added uh, variable support. So you can do vec set of a variable number, and I, I use the vector shift and all that kind of stuff. OK, now we get on to Seger's favorite topic, shrink wrapping. Um, currently, r right now, if the basic block needs a anything from the prolog, the whole prolog, you get the whole prolog. And in a lot of programs, it would be nice to only save parts of the prolog, do a test, and then exit, and then do a, a bigger test where you need more, more of the saved instructions and all that kind of stuff. A, but right now, GCC is all or, no, all or none. And we found a p few places, and in fact, we're, we're now getting customers that say, we, we really need this and all. And as Seger says, it gets worse on wide and deep CPUs that run into microarchitectural traps, load hit store. And it, it's the store queue in the PowerPC that the problem is, is you do the store for all the values of the saved registers. And you only do two or three instructions, and then you want to do the return and do all the loads from those stores. But it ha the loads have to wait for the store queue to finish, or at least the store queue containing the, the loads, before it can, it can actually do it. There's no reach in and, and grab the thing from the, the store queue. So we, we've been seeing this on a lot of, a lot of benchmarks. And it, it is ongoing. And we've been iterating from May with patches and a lot of work before that uh, that splits up the shrink wrapping into smaller pieces and all, all that kind of stuff. 
And um, in general, it, it increases performance by 2% on power eight and much more for some tests. Reassociation is another thing that Aaron Saudry <laughs> has been working on. And I, d I don't remember exactly all the details, so, um, but it parallel reassociation rearranges the ads and multiply and ads and so forth. And on a machine with, with built-in floating point multiply and add, it can sometimes generate just lots of, lots of multiplies and lots of ads because it's trying to be, be, be more parallel. But it doesn't realize that it, it can do the combination. And we, we did a lot of testing. There's a target hook to, to set the reassociation parallel. And it turns out that, um, you know, we ran spec and other benchmarks a lot of times, micro benchmarks. We could not find a, a thing that on power seven and power six did not degrade some benchmarks. So for there, we just set the reassociation back to the standard one. But on power eight, we did find that vectors of a width of four gives improvement. Integers width of six for multiply or four otherwise, because the multiplier has a longer clock cycle. And decimal, because there's only one decimal unit, the width of one. What? He, he tried all different numbers. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, he, he took over one of our spec machines for a week or two weeks and just ran all possible combinations. Yeah, yeah. No, I, th I think all you have is the mode. You're given the mode, and, and it, it's you, you, you give back a number. Yeah, it, it would be more useful to have something that says you're in the middle of the loop or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. But if you want to talk, Aaron Saudry is the person to email about, um, you know, to, to do com combined stuff in the future. And one of the things, one of the other be customer benchmark was a Fortran thing, and they were doing what I in C terms is L round, that is convert it to the nearest integer but keep it in floating point. A and um, but you have to round it away from <laughs> from zero, and it turned out there was a destruction in in Power Seven. We missed it in the Power Seven days. We added it now, and it helps us particular benchmark and anybody else who happens to use that particular code. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, comments, questions? Yes, Nick. How much more work do you think there is to this to the implementation for ISO 3? To be honest, we haven't finished ISO 207 and 206 yet. <laughs> but no, um, you know, our big deadline is what what's in GCC 7. I suspect there will be stuff in GCC 8, particularly as we get real silicon and, and start learning the performance, interesting features of, of the machine that don't necessarily appear or we didn't think about in, in, in the internal documentation. So I would assume that most of the enablement stuff will be in GCC 7. The tuning will be in GCC 8. And, you know, figure GCC 9 or GCC 10 will be power 10. Yeah.